July of 1943 and Allied strategic bombing had been intensified with Operation Point Blank, an all-out strategic bomber offensive coordinated between the Royal Air Force Bomber Command and the United States Army Air Forces. It was part of the Casablanca Directive, so named because of decisions made by U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt and Prime Minister Winston Churchill of the United Kingdom at a conference held in Casablanca, French Morocco, in January of 1943. In short, the Casablanca Directive directed the Allied Air Forces to destroy the ability of Nazi Germany to to wage war in order to pave the way for an allied invasion of occupied Europe using strategic bombing. U.S. bombers alone, many of them B-17 bombers flying with the 8th Air Force out of England, dropped more than a million and a half tons of bombs on Europe as part of the combined bomber offensive. And so you would think in July of 1943, when the local butcher woke up to hear a bomber overhead and bombs dropping, that that was a terrible but routine part of fighting the largest war in human history. But this time it wasn't quite routine because that butcher was in Boys City in the panhandle of Oklahoma in what seemed far removed from the war. And the story of the only city in Oklahoma to suffer aerial bombardment during the Second World War deserves to be remembered. On the night of July 5th, 1943, four B-17 bombers of the 333rd Bombardment Group took off from Dalhart Army Air Base near the town of Dalhart in the Texas Panhandle. They were on a night practice bombing run, heading for an illuminated target near Conlin, Texas, some 20 miles away. The Boeing B-17 is one of the most iconic aircraft of the Second World War. Originally designed for a 1934 U.S. Army Air Corps proposal for a multi-engine bomber to replace the Martin B-10, the newspaper of the Seattle Times saw the machine guns bristling from the prototype, the Boeing Model 299, and coined the term Flying Fortress. The name stuck. Thirteen were ordered in January of 1936 under the name Y-1B-17 and delivered in August of 1937. Development progressed at a slow pace, and less than 200 B-17s had been delivered by the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor. But production quickly ramped up, and by the end of the war more than 12,000 of the heavy bombers were delivered. B-17s were used in all theaters of the war, and during World War II, the B-17 equipped 32 overseas combat groups. Prior to 1944, a crewman's tour of duty was set at 25 missions. As a measure of the hazards they would encounter, it is estimated that the average crewman had only a 1 in 4 chance of actually completing his tour of duty. In June of 1943, the month before the training mission took off from Dalhart, the U.S. Army 8th Air Force, operating heavy bombers from England supporting Operation Point Blank, largely designed to help prepare for the invasion of occupied Europe by destroying Germany's fighter aircraft strength, suffered 903 casualties, killed, wounded, or missing in action. The Air Force had to make good those losses, and in fact significantly expand the number of bomber groups to continue the strategic air campaign. The 333rd Bombardment Group was a replacement training unit, or RTU, that trained individual pilots or air crews. Graduates of the training would be assigned to new combat groups or be sent directly to the European Theater of Operations for assignment as replacements for the growing losses among strategic bomber crews. The town of Dalhart, Texas is in the sparsely populated Texas Panhandle, and is actually closer to Cheyenne, the capital of Wyoming, than Austin, the capital of Texas. While Dalhart is the county seat of Dallam County, much of the town actually lies in neighboring Hartley County to the south. An agricultural community, the town's population prior to the Second World War was approximately 4,600. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the town petitioned the U.S. Army Air Corps to build a training base, saying that is the best way for the small town to contribute to the war effort. Dalhart Army Airfield opened in May of 1942, using land southwest of Dalhart and therefore in Hartley County. The airfield was initially used for training glider operations with the 14th Troop Carrier Squadron. In February 1943, the mission changed, and Dalhart Army Airfield was transferred to the 2nd Air Force, assigned to train bomber crews for the Bomber Command. Training to become a crew member of a heavy bomber was thorough. By the time a trainee had reached Dalhart, it had already undergone at least six weeks of basic training and four weeks of advanced aviation-related coursework, including math, physics, and flight mechanics. Pilots and co-pilots had undergone primary pilot training in light two-seater instructor planes, basic pilot training in more powerful training aircraft that included formation training, flying by instruments, and flying at night, and advanced pilot training, where pilot cadets were identified for either single-engine or multi-engine training in more advanced trainer aircraft. The training at Dalhart was the last part of the process, where pilot cadets finalized their training on actual fighters or bombers. 
other members of the 10-person crew of a B-17 would have received six weeks of gunnery training, plus an additional 12 to 18 weeks training for bombardiers, radio operators, or navigators. Around half past midnight on July 5th, the young navigator aboard the lead B-17 of the training mission saw the bright lights, four lighted corners that represented their bombing target area, and the crew of the B-17 began its practice bombing run. Piston engine bombers of the Second World War were complex to operate, in many ways much more complicated than flying aircraft today, which are assisted by computers. During the Second World War, only around a third of casualties among air crews occurred in combat. In fact, a crewman had almost twice as much chance of dying in a training accident or being transported to the front than being shot down by the enemy. Accidents were tragically common. Between 1941 and 1945, the United States Army Air Force suffered more than 15,500 men killed in accidents inside the United States. After midnight on July 5th, most of the population of the town of Boise City, Oklahoma, were sound asleep. The county seat of Cimarron County, the farthest western county in the Oklahoma Panhandle, Boise City had a 1943 population of about 1,100. In 1908, the Southwestern Immigration and Development Company of Guthrie, Oklahoma, had sold lots in the town, describing it as an elegant tree-lined city with paved streets, numerous businesses, railroad service, and an artesian well. It was a scam. Not only were the claims false, the developers didn't even have actual title to the lots they sold. The developers were convicted of fraud and sent to prison, but the people caught in the scam managed to incorporate the town anyway in 1925. A ranching and farming community, Boise City had suffered greatly during the Dust Bowl era of the Great Depression. The post office in Boise City was operated by a man named Forrest Bork, who resided in the upstairs of the building. When he heard what sounded like a crash and an explosion, he thought maybe someone was trying to bust into the post office safe. In fact, what he had heard was the explosion of a practice bomb dropped by the Dalhart B-17 group. Somehow, the navigator had been off, and instead of the bomb target in Conlin, Texas, the B-17s were 40 miles off course, where the navigator had mistaken the four lights surrounding the Cimarron County Courthouse for their bombing target. Practice bombs are very different than real bombs, but they are nonetheless dangerous, loaded with four pounds of dynamite and 60 pounds of sand. The first bomb had gone through the roof of Forrest Bork's garage near the post office, just missing the home of S.E. Ferguson, where eight people slept, and leaving a four-foot-deep hole in the floor. Town butcher Hurley Reed and his wife Hazel had been jolted out of bed by the noise and had run into the street. R.D. Dodd, the pastor of the local Baptist church, and his wife had also been awakened, but hadn't turned on the lights as they did not want to wake their sleeping eight-year-old son. Fred Krieger, the editor of the local newspaper, the Boys City News, said later that he ran out in the street after he heard the first bomb, thinking, why in the heck would anyone want to bomb Boys City? The growing number of residents roused by the noise could hear the sound of the plane engines and could tell that the plane had circled around and was coming back towards the town. There was the telltale whistling sound of a bomb falling, and a second explosion happened near Pastor Dodd's church. Dodd threw on overalls and went to see the extent of the damage. The bomb had narrowly missed the church, exploding just outside, knocking out several of the church's windows. As the bomber turned around again, County Sheriff Harris Powell had figured out where the planes must have come from and got on the telephone and called Dalhart. The base started radioing the bomber crew to tell them they were off course. By then, a third bomb had made a crater in Cimarron Avenue, just 60 yards from the courthouse. Town resident Don Rudy, just five years old at the time, later recalled seeing his dad standing in the doorway, remarking to his mother, Well, goddamn, Irene, they're bombing us! Not everyone had been asleep when the bomb started falling. The town had an all-night cafe, which was a popular spot for truck drivers passing through town. Several had been in the cafe when the bomb started falling. They immediately realized the danger. They had been driving fuel trucks. They raced to their trucks, trying to get out of town. A fourth bomb only narrowly missed the last truck, hitting Cimarron Avenue and throwing mud all over the porch of resident Lee Wright. By then, Frank Garrett, the superintendent of the Southwestern Public Service Company, in charge of the town's power and utilities, had rushed to the city's power plant. As a sixth bomb fell outside the home of the Boy City attorney, E.B. McMahon, Garrett threw the main power switch, cutting off the city's power supply and shutting off the lights. It is not clear whether the bomber crew had received notification from Dalhart or whether it was because the lights went out, but the bomber left, and the 30-minute air raid on Boy City, Oklahoma, came to an end. In the morning, agents from the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the U.S. Army Air Force showed up to try to assess the damage and determine what happened. Lee Wright, who had slept through the entire incident, was just trying to figure out who had thrown mud all over his porch in the middle of the night. There were real risks. Some of the bombs landed very close to houses where people were sleeping and someone could have been killed, but no one was. And in fact, the entire assessed damage to Boy City was assessed at around 
$25. The people of the city were surprisingly unperturbed by what happened. They pretty much universally agreed that they'd been through much worse during the Dust Bowl era. In fact, Frank Garrett, the utilities manager, was quoted in the Amarillo Daily News as worrying about the navigator of the plane. He asserted that the man's equipment must have failed and he hoped that the army wouldn't be too hard on him. Boy City was not the only town in the United States to be accidentally bombed with training bombs during the Second World War. The towns of Tarnov, Nebraska and Sierra Blanca, Texas also were struck accidentally by training bombs and thankfully no one died in either of those incidents either. But the navigational errors carried over into the theaters of war and the United States and Great Britain accidentally bombed neutral Switzerland at least 70 times due to navigational errors during the Second World War, killing 84 people. The crew of the plane went on to serve in Europe, distinguished service, and they all returned home alive. In July 1993, the town of Boise City commemorated a small memorial to remember the 50th anniversary of the day that Boise City was bombed. The plaque reads, Boise City bombed July 5th, 1943, still booming July 5th, 1993. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.